This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. Good. Sorry about the delay. No, no, I'm sorry if I didn't I didn't see you pop up uh, there. So sorry if you've been kept waiting at all. Oh, that's all right. I, was, I got at about 807, but I thought maybe you, you assumed I flaked out or something. I, uh, I tried no, to no. text out. But... No, no, in normal uh, life, that would be such a like normal time to arrive. But Zoom, everybody's like, oh, seven minutes. It might, <laughs> might no longer go ahead. <laughs> so, so I always try and try and say like leave it till like 20 past or something 15 past okay. before saying saying anything um yeah. but thank you very much for coming on the show Ken really appreciate it welcome to the no greatest problem. music of all time podcast and I wanted to start by asking you uh can you pinpoint or, or remember when you first got drawn into music um I mean, I think I was probably, uh, you know, 10, 11 years old. I think the typical pattern of, you know, uh, some older kids in my neighborhood just introducing me to, you know, the classic rock stuff of, you know, whether it was the Stones or ACDC or Led Zeppelin and all that. And then um, when I was 13 years old, a kid on my baseball team made, made me a, a tape of, uh, London Calling and The Clash, The Clash. And um, that was when I went, okay, this is my music. And uh, that was what I think I went from a listener to a participant to a fan, you know. Um, I, you know, ended up booking, you know, just involved in the music scene here before I was ever in a band, booking shows, all ages like matinees, uh, you know, which was the popular thing for band said it was a famous club called the rat that was like our cbgb's and um you know they really didn't care what happened in the daytime because they wanted to book you know touring acts in, in the nighttime and have the bar open and say hey you want you know you want the downstairs pay us a percentage of the door and um you know we would pack that place out with some touring bands and some just local bands and, and, um, in the mid nine in the early 90s when I was booking there into the mid 90s when Dropkick Murphy started I mean they, we were selling out the place with local bands including Dropkick Murphy some of which you didn't even have music recorded or released it's crazy to think wow. of that now you know yeah completely so yeah. so bands would play to packed places and well, in this case, to a specific packed place. And, you know, they wouldn't have even had a record out. They would have people just yeah. had an appetite for the live. Yeah, might might have a single or, you know, or, or they saw them, you know, opening for someone else. And, you know, that, that was the case with us. We, we were opening up for a lot of bands on shows I booked, you know, and so we got to put ourselves in front of people and, um, just, you know, oh, well, you, when are you on the next show? And I would always make flyers, you know, to promote uh, three or four shows out. And I think the difference thing that I always did with the band with flyers is, you know, typically a local band would only fly for their next local show, you know, and I would make a flyer for our next local show, but also highlight where we were playing regionally, like, you know, New Hampshire <laughs> or Rhode Island, you know, and people would be like, oh my God, they're leaving the state already, you know, and it made yeah. us seem so uh exotic no but it made us yeah, seem yeah. like it made people go like oh, they must be doing good sometimes the music perception is half the battle you know what i mean like if they're already playing in new hampshire i better not miss them here it sounds so funny to say playing in new hampshire you know because for us that was like we were on a world tour you know <laughs> it was an hour away <laughs> but that's that's such a good point perception is half the battle if you see somebody with not that many listeners now on a streaming service, you're like, oh, they're not that big. And uh, and same with social media and all that side of things is quite destructive in a way. And it sounds like a bygone era as well. You're, you know, talking about 
people even going to see bands and not really knowing who they are and it's feel, really it's really strange change? yeah it's really strange to think about a lot of i get asked this question a lot with like someone will say like you know my nephew's starting a band can you talk to him about how we should provide said he's starting in a world that's so complete i mean we used to press our own seven inch singles have to you know waiting a month for them to come back you know print the covers ourselves you know put order this the plastic sleeves put you know put them all together uh you know pick out ads in magazines like maximum rock and roll or whatever and or, or get reviews and send them out for reviews and then people would read the a review of just your single and then they might order the record and then we'd make this little handmade flyer uh for like other merchandise we have we used to print our own t-shirts so when i tell you that the flyer was just basically an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper folded over to make like a like a catalog i'll say <laughs> it looks like a six-year-old drew it i mean i was draw <laughs> drawing our t-shirt designs on like stick figures i mean i don't know whether people bought it because they liked us or they felt bad for us you know but <laughs> But that process of mail ordering for something, having to wait, you know, and getting then, and then we send the single back, they get the catalog, they put their, you know, $10 in a money order in the mail and send it back for two more weeks. You know, it was just, but, it was yeah. so less immediate, you know? And I think that when you went to those efforts to correspond with the band or to purchase their merchandise and music, it was such a more special thing. It was like, you, you know, um, Christmas Story, that movie with little Ralphie, you know, that plays every Christmas, like when he's waiting for his uh, decoder ring or whatever to come, you know? Yeah. Like, and I've been on that side waiting by the mailbox for the music to come. And man, it's just so much more immediate now. And I'm not knocking that. I mean, that I think it's easier for bands to get their music out in their name or where it's more difficult is to keep the attention of the people because there's so much more coming at you. You know, um, I was, I was, yeah. reading an article, I was reading an article the other day and it was talking about some of the festival people and they were talking about, it was, it was actually a, a British festival that um, they noticed that the, the teenage crowd, they don't even stay for a whole set. Now they come, what? They stay ah. for 15 minutes. They want to get, you know, their Instagram photo, hear the hit, and then they run to the next stage. And it's like, why you can't, you know, you can't, a band can't hold an audience for a 45 minute festival set. It's a, that's, that's something that's got to be worrisome to a band. I mean, luckily I feel like our, our fans for the most part have aged with us, you know? Um, so you started in what in my mind is the last era where you get i mean there have been a few exceptions but getting uh getting a fan base that really is a proper fan base like you're talking about a kind of i'm i'm gonna wait for the record type of fan base and i've got the physical item in my house type of fan base not a kind of i'm gonna stream one song or as you're describing take a photo uh, t you know film film one of the hits and then move on to the next set after 15 minutes that's all yeah i i think potentially hopefully you know obviously vinyl is coming back and there's that nostalgia for it and i think some kids and and i also think and i know this is true for myself in the pandemic era having a little bit more free time i mean a lot of the times i think there's a generation that doesn't listen to albums and streams their music but it's also part and parcel of we're always on the move well you know you don't have your, your record player beside you you know in the car you know so it's like yeah having a, this time home more than normal definitely gave me more time to like put on albums, listen to whole albums again. And I think that it's easy if you're a streaming person to say, I'm going to listen. Oh, if you're a kid, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try listen to the whole album, not just the hit. Well, then the phone rings and then this happens, you know, but if you put on, you put on a proper album at home on your record player, it's like, it's a pretty good chance you're going to listen to the whole thing. And, yeah, it kind of reminded me. I've always talked about the experience because I remember from my youth, but I feel like I've re-experienced it during the pandemic, and and hopefully maybe that leads to a little bit of a change in the way people listen to music. You know, yeah, the al listening to music in albums is so much better than playlisting, especially mm -hmm. if you know you like. Say you only like rock music, like the Spotify suggestions for rock music are just the most kind of like basic. It's like 
satisfaction by the Rolling Stones or, you know, great records, but ones that you've heard like, you know, millions and millions of times, you're not going to be listening to that stuff every day. Albums are just great. And, and it's those deep cuts on the albums as well that, yeah, that we still make, make being a music We band. still make records that way of, you know, really putting tons of time into like, yeah, but, but no, no, but that song needs to be track eight because it's at this flow and this, and then we laugh and go, does anyone even care about that anymore? But, you know, for us, I think we'll always approach making an album that way, you know? Um, well, your, your new album, I've had the pleasure of listening to it and it's fantastic. Turn up you. that dial. Um, and it's out April the 30th from what I understand. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And so wh when did you record this album? We recorded, we started to record in, in late, uh, like maybe late November, December of 2019. And then right, right. they had a, a couple of tours and the plan was to um, finish the album right after March, our touring ended. We, we were in Europe in January, February, and then um, we had Boston shows in March and then the plan was to finish uh, right then. But uh, clearly, you know, the world had other plans. So, you yeah. know, there was a there was a four or five month period where we kind of sat there going, geez, will we ever finish this record? And will anyone ever release a record again? I don't know. And then um, and then we kind of got back into it a little by slow. We started to write with, um, you know, just using really relying on technology more than we ever have. Here I am bashing technology for the first mm -hmm. half of the interview. But I mean, you know, garage band, uh, Pro Tools, all that stuff. But even a simple app, like we use this app called Spire, um, it's just on your phone. And we're just like, I got an idea, boom, I'm gonna record it on Spire, send it to the band, I might, you know. And we we, we created this like, uh, kind of constantly updating ourselves on the ideas, even though we weren't together, it was like, wow, this actually moves the process faster you know instead of saying hey i got a couple ideas i'll i'll see you guys next wednesday at practice you know it was like immediate yeah. people were thinking about their parts and whatnot and um and then we approached the studio the same way and you know which wasn't great but i think in the end you don't you know i don't i think the overall motivation to get done superseded the separation because we had to record one at a time um and you know it's nice when your bandmates are on the other side of the glass watching you cheering you on, but let's face it, after 25 years of doing something, the bandmates are usually not up going, yeah, that was a great take there. <laughs> They're on the phone and drinking coffee or whatever. <laughs> so uh, it, I don't know, it just, it didn't seem too bad. We were just so happy to be getting the opportunity. I actually remember that first call to the studio saying, what about if, it's just the engineer in his room and one band member, you know, per day or whatever in the other room. We we're coming in and, you know, spraying everything down and, you know, I mean, treating it like it was like the riskiest thing ever to do. When you think about it, I mean, you couldn't have been more socially distanced. One guy in one room, another guy in the other. Yeah. But at the time, it was like, do you leave your house, you know? So, um, yeah, things have things have progressed a lot as as you know, the vaccines have happened. Yeah. So we felt up. like, we felt like we were uh, already pushing the envelope to try to going in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let alone um, trying to say like, Oh, we need to have four or five of us there. And at the time, you know, you were worried about obviously bringing something home to your family and stuff. So um, of course, yeah. So we, we, we didn't get caught up in the, like being bummed out that we couldn't have us all in there together. We were actually just excited to be able to be making progress on the album. When did you get it get it finished? Uh, it's been done for a long time. The reason it's waited to come out till now is, you know, we had the option to release it a lot earlier, but it would have meant that the uh, the audio slash streaming came out sooner, and then the vinyl would have come out like four months later. There was just such a, a you know, like like what's happening in so much of the world with the backlog with shipping and manufacturing. Vinyl, yeah vinyl was way backed out and it was a painful decision because you know when you're sitting on finished music you want people to hear it but i'm so glad now that we waited and just uh you know that that it all will come out on the same day so um because I, I i really am happy with how like the packaging came out and that's another thing with us it's like you know we're into that just as much as we're into the music that physical packaging which you know not to sound like a jaded old guy, but that's that's lost on a lot of people, and a lot of people will never touch that physical packaging because they'll only listen to 
the street put on stream you know yeah but the physical packaging and you guys have such a great fan base that there'll be a lot of people who will really appreciate that um and and in terms of you know how many songs were done in the 2019 sessions versus kind of during the pandemic what 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 parts of the albums were yeah, probably four i think four and then you know then there were more and then they were gonna go on the record and then we wrote other songs that we thought were better and you know so we or, or, or not even necessarily better but like maybe um like we you know part of this whole mentality was we want an uplifting rousing album that will help you know lift people's spirits coming out of this uh terrible time so we had some other songs and I'm not saying these other songs were sad by any means, but they weren't like, you know, they, they might've been a little darker say, and yeah. we, we have four or five songs that we're like super excited about to release on the next album. And normally we never do that because we'll say, Oh, we'll, re we'll release that on the next album. But we end up feeling like, well, if it wasn't good enough to be on this album, but this decision wasn't so based on like, which songs, which, we have 15 songs. There's no other criteria except what's best. Let's pick the best 11. On this, it was what's, we actually feel like we have some songs that are better than the others, but they, they were, they were had them, they had, they were minory, they were dark and dark musically, you know? And, um, and so we just said, well, we, you know, we're a quarter of the way to being a third of the way done with the next album, you know? Do you guys have plans to tour this album as things open up? You know, right now, I think we're going to announce uh, on the day of the album or the day after, we're going to announce um, some uh, January, February dates in Europe. Um, you know, wow. definitely a fingers crossed thing. But at this point, yeah. it's like, hey, man, like, uh, let's look on the bright side. And I, I, I feel like, you know, there's been an other tour announcements like, you know, we announced festival dates this summer back a while ago. And we're like, ah, the festivals want us to announce, but I don't think it's going to happen. And of course, they didn't happen. They're all now rescheduled to 2022. Um, yeah, yeah, they are, aren't they? Yeah, but we're hoping that, uh, you know, by January, February, we've got some, um, you know, some big dates booked in England and Iowa, which we hope maybe at least the vaccination process there is good enough you know yeah um, yeah well it's opening then, it's opening yeah. here yeah we've got some dates in america for september that we're working on but you know it's all a day at a time really because you never you never do know at this point you know yeah and w were you on tour when when uh the pandemic when lockdown started so we were we were on tour in february in europe and now i usually for 25 years after the show go down to the front thank the people you know talk to the people that are in the front row and everything and i've never not done that for 25 years and on this tour i didn't because we already knew in february hey there's this thing going on you catch it you're gonna take the whole band down and the tour will be canceled so you know it was just when that word was starting to come out <clears throat> and I remember I went the whole tour without going down and talking to the kids. And, and we had a show in Milan towards the end of February, one of our last shows of the tour. And, um, you know, we're trying to get off the stage and the Italian fans are just so like passionate and they're like, yeah, okay, Casey, come back, okay, Casey. And uh, so I said, oh, I'll say hi to one person. And <laughs> next thing I know, I've shook hands and hugged 400 people. And, <laughs> The next day they came out, you know, massive, uh, you know, outbreak in Milan, shut the city down. And I said, oh, my God, there's no way I don't have coronavirus. And uh, I took an antibody test and it turns out I didn't get it. But my point is, right. even even by even in February of 2020, we were already getting the word and having to take precautions. So that tour ended <clears throat> in London in the very end. The, I think it was the last day of February. We came home. We had a couple of weeks off and then we were starting our yearly, you know, St. Patrick's Day run of shows. And just as the first one was about to start, I think it was maybe Thursday, the 13th or something like that. And, um, you know, it was, should we shut down? Should we not? And we ended up canceling ourselves just because we felt like it was morally uh, the right thing to do. And then a day or two later, the state, uh canceled everything anyway so um yeah so it was smack dab in the middle of when we had you know our biggest shows of the year maybe not the biggest but 
they're the most, they're kind of like our calendar reset because, you know, we're touring all year and you come home and you play. We only really play those Boston shows once a year. Maybe every few years we'll do one outside show in the summer, but typically we play six or seven shows in Boston in mid-March and that's it. Yeah. So when we come back home, it's like, it's a special experience playing in front of your families, your kids, you know, your parents are there. It's, 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 um, it's a unique thing. So to have to cancel those shows was definitely harder for us to deal with than most your typical show. Yeah. Yeah. It's the kind of highlight of the year, but this, this year you did a stream. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we did a stream last year too, right? We were three, three or four days into the lockdown. Um, and you got it together we, last year. I, I thought this year was the first. Wow. So you got oh, it together. Yeah, we, did. We, were, we were one of the first, I think we were the first or second band to do a stream. And then as luck would have it, we were really the first and also kind of the last band to do a full band live stream because at the time we did it, they had, they just a few days into the lockdown, they had said no more than 25 people together. So we were able to do a full band with the full crew and the camera, cameras and everything. And then within days after that, that's when you started seeing, you know, musicians playing on their couch with an acoustic guitar because they couldn't have anybody there. Yeah. And then we did another live stream in end of May at the baseball stadium, Fenway Park, but we had to use wow. massive social distancing for that. We had to play you know, outside in a ballpark that holds 35,000 people, the city and the Red Sox only allowed 35 people in the park. So, you know, with all the cameras and all the logistics, we, you know, we were only allowed 35 people and um, that was pretty difficult to pull off. And then, yeah, this, this, this past St. Patrick's Day was our third one. So we're becoming, we're becoming veterans of the, of the uh, live streaming. Uh, yeah. And then May first, May first, we'll do our fourth. It'll be a record release party. So, wow! And I hope to God that's our last one. Oh, at yeah. least with no, with no people there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you feel it doesn't measure up? I mean, obviously it's a good thing to do in the meantime, but obviously it could never measure up because obviously there was some talk about live streaming, maybe replacing concerts and stuff from some of the uh, Silicon Valley type. People. Yeah, no, but I no, but I think that there'll be that mentality of like I think we'll always decide we'll stream our Boston shows mm. you know, in the future because I think there's people in Indonesia or wherever it might be that are never coming there, but they might want to see us play our hometown, you know. So I think there'll be that occasion to stream special occasion type shows, you know. Uh, we've approached yeah, live. We've approached the live stream as trying to do stuff that we ordinarily wouldn't do in a normal show. So it's not like normal show, but with no fans. Like on this past St. Patrick's Day and on this May first show coming up, we built the video wall on all four sides. So we the bands kind of facing each other, and there's video content going behind us on four sides. Well, clearly, if there's a fan base there, you can't have walls on four sides. So. <laughs> Um, you know, hopefully that gives it a bit of a unique standalone feeling to people, you know. Yeah, more or less the first stream that anyone had, had heard about. Yeah, well, it was really only because, you know, there was such a letdown to tell people it's canceled. I don't think if, yeah. we, didn't, if we didn't have shows that weekend, I don't think we would have been saying, oh, we need to do a live stream. But we felt like to counteract the news of canceling the shows... We, you know, we, at least we had a, but <laughs> we'll do this, you know, and it also it was St. Patrick's day. I mean, you know, and, and we got a massive yeah, huge thing. thing. People will say like, you know, but there was no fans. They say, yeah, no, there was nobody there, but 10 million people watched it. That's way more than we've ever played to in another show. So as much as it's not ideal, it's not fun in, in, in the immediate feedback kind of way, you know, you're getting to reach a lot of people. So um, yeah. And, and making a lot of people happy during a time that where everybody was like really confused as to what planet they were living on. Well, at that point, sports were shut down. I mean, I remember then, you know, you were just desperate for content. I mean, I would have watched a, you know, uh, a dog friggin' play a kazoo. I don't know, whatever. You were just like, <laughs> so happy to have something to watch. I'm sure half the people, half those 10 million were going, who the hell is this? Uh, but, but, you know, maybe you get some new long-term fans that way too, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure, especially that first one, loads of people would. You know, would you know what was really that. nice actually is a lot of people, as we've been a band 25 years, because people would post their stories of watching the show, you know, the next day, and a lot of people saying it was great because I got to introduce my kids to your music, because maybe they were too young to be out at a Dropkick Murphy show and some of the parents would comment, oh boy, my my children, you know, they listen, obviously if the parents listen to it in the car, hopefully the kid starts to listen to it and like it, but the kids are saying, oh, well, why can't you ever take me to a show? So it was, it was cool to see the parents watching it with little kids, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and something that's, you know, must must have been a real challenge to, uh, to deal with, I, I wanted to ask about um, was, was, of course, you know, you being an amazing bass player, but kind of having to pass over bass duties. For those who don't know and aren't familiar, what was what was the, the story there? You, uh, why did you have to undergo surgery? And, and yeah, um... so, so I it, the story got kind of mistaken on social media, I had had a, a an, an incident slash accident when I was um, in my late teens that I never got properly fixed. So I'd always had this like nerve damage, neck problems and it, you know, eventually my whole arm went numb, couldn't feel my fingers. And obviously it's hard to play an instrument when you can't feel your fingers. So I went yeah, on, to, sure. I had to go under this kind of emergency surgery uh, right before a tour. And we we're lucky enough to have an old friend, uh, 15 year plus employee, uh, Kevin Rowe, who um, has filled in for all of us in the past. Uh, the only one he hasn't filled in on is drums and he can actually play the drums too. And um, wow. yeah, he, he, he's, he's amazing. And so he filled in for me and I just sang during that tour. And during that tour, Al's father had just died and he was having a hard time being out front as the front man. Cause he was like, man, him and his father were so close. And so my job was to kind of keep a smile on, try to keep Al cheered up. And, and we just developed this dynamic of like, wow, this is kind of fun, you know? And I mean, I had always sang and kind of been the guy that talked to the audience, but obviously, you know, in a way the instrument kept me from having that connection I wanted, you know? And, um, and so, especially in the biggest stages that we just said, geez, we think it's better this way because, you know, if Al, you know, instead of, because we're not a band that's about like looking over the audience, you know, and just pretending they're not there. We're trying to make eye contact and, and connect with people. Yeah. So if, Al, if Al's on this side of the stage connecting people and I'm on this side of the stage making eye contact with someone, and then we're switching and uh, it just seemed like, it seemed like something happened with the audience that it was a little more exciting because there was two people able to connect with them and, um, and then we just didn't want to take the job back from Kevin because he's just been, man, he's been instrumental. I mean, when you, you know, when you, in 25 years of touring, we've had sadly deaths or many things that someone's had to go home, you know, for a funeral or whatever. And to not have to like cancel shows because you've got a guy with you that can just jump in and, and fill in while someone's gone or someone's hurt or someone's sick and um, someone's in rehab. Um, you know, uh, it's been instrumental. So we're, we're, we're psyched. So it was kind of also like, uh, you know, just just giving Kevin that well-deserved promotion, I guess you'd call it, you know? Yeah, that's, that's such a uh, nice thing to have come out of it. And yeah, Kevin is incredibly talented from what I've heard on, on the, is he playing bass on the new record? He plays bass on the new record. Originally, I was going to play bass on the new record, but we also found, as like one of the primary songwriters in the band, the bass was always the afterthought instrument for me. I, I'm always writing lyrics, and a lot of times when I, almost always when I write lyrics, it's, you know, in the form of a full melody line, the song's sung, and then we're going back and putting the instrumentation on, you know, um, you know on a lot of the songs. So, And then bass would always be this, like, total afterthought that oftentimes I was like in the studio Tim and I working together on it like oh shit I hadn't put any thought into the bass and and, it, and I feel like it, it not having that looming on me made uh the songwriting so much like freer I, it was just yeah kind of pouring out of me you know um so hopefully I'll be able to 
continue on, um, you know, I don't know, I got on a good, it, it gets streaky with songwriting the ideas are flowing, you know, I'm actually went back to college during the pandemic. I had three years of um, university done before the band started 25 years ago and we we're locked down in January. And I said, I'm going to go back to college online. Really? And, wow. uh, yeah. What were been, you studying? Uh, I was actually studying to be a special special education teacher, you know, kids with disabilities and stuff. And I obviously won't go back to that because uh, it's not going to work with my life. Uh, so it's just a basic uh, general, you know, liberal arts uh, degree is what I'll get now. But I, I just kind of wanted to get it. I have a daughter that's in college now and I wanted to beat her to the punch, you know, and uh, <laughs> just do it for the sake of doing it. But actually all that work is really kind of... Um, it took that space in my mind that was writing songs. So I was like, Oh God, it was, I was, on a, I was on a serious roll for a while there. So, uh, I, I have two more, two more weeks left for the semester. So I'll have to get back to writing a lot of songs in the summer. After that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I suppose bass, you know, is, is a great thing to play and you were obviously a very accomplished bass player, but it's like with singing and songwriting, it's you know your role in the band is is the crucial role regardless of of that and it sounds like Kevin that's such a nice thing for for him to come in and like become a band member after being yeah and he's a way, great he's, part he's, of he's, he's actually a way better bass player than me so I actually think it's <laughs> no I'm not I'm serious because I learned I I started to play three weeks before the band you know and then it started and then it was just like learn on the job and. When you're learning on the job, it's a cool, unique way to learn. And I think you ha it creates some specialty to it. But at the same time, you really, I never really mastered the instrument because it was always just like, what's the next task? Okay, you know, these songs and then these songs. And I just never, I never stopped to play for the sake of playing, you know? So um, I, I think I'm, that's the case for loads of players though, isn't it? In terms of learning on the job. Uh, yeah, and I think it's like anything, if you, if, you, if you do something for that many uh, months a year, the last thing you want to come home and do is play it That's for the theory. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the tracks I just wanted to highlight um, was Middle Finger. Uh, what, what, what's the kind of attitude that you were, that you were gleaning uh, like when, when writing that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's just about kind of a rebellious spirit, but obviously, you know, the name middle finger, you know, you think, well, they just singing about giving people the finger. And it was actually like the thought process was like that inability to not give the middle finger, like, you know, that as an, it, it smash it, smash it up's kind of a similar mindset. Um, but smash it up is more thinking about now, like I'm an adult now and man, I'd like to tell this person where to go or what to do, or I like to be dangerous again, like I might have been as a kid, but I can't because I'm an adult. So now you go into this fantasy world, you know, middle finger is more looking back on youth or 20s when someone crossed me even slightly, I was going to let them know what I thought. Whereas in real life, you don't like what someone does. Oftentimes, the best way to succeed in life is to just shut your mouth and, you know, take it on the chin and, and you know, whether it's from a boss or whatever. And I think in my youth, I would not be capable of doing that, you know, and and a lot of times that included people in positions of power and authority, which made my life much harder. So it was just about being born into that rebellious spirit of like, you're going to speak your mind no matter how much pain it causes you. Um, and I'd like to think that uh, I've got this much more wisdom as an adult that I can. <laughs> that Do I you can think keep. that's the case though about, uh, about, you know, you've, you've got to keep it shut down, you know, being too like, outlandish, uh, outspoken, forthright in order to succeed. Because I always admire those people, you know, who say what they think all, uh, all the time, even if it's like it makes you cringe because it's so awkward and aggressive. But well, know, I mean, that's difficult that's to of, do. That's kind of a different animal being like outspoken, awkward and aggressive. I, 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 I would I'm more talking about like, uh, you know, you don't have to. What, what's that saying? You don't have to show up to every fight you're invited to or to every battle, you know, and 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 I would. Uh, 
you know, just even in the early days of the band, whether it was, you know, security or promoters, if, you know, someone didn't, someone disrespected us, it was going to be, you know, and uh, no, and I, and I wouldn't change a thing, you know what I mean? So I'm not saying you can't succeed. Obviously we have succeeded. I just, it's just kind of a chuckle inward. It's saying like looking back going, Oh man, you know, if I, if I was a little, if I was a little more mature at that moment, that might have not <laughs> turned into a scene, you know what I mean? I might not have lost that job or whatever, but, um, but such is life. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, I think it's also something that is ingrained in my DNA and, you know, it is what it is. And I'd rather be that than be a pushover, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, I don't think anybody could could accuse you of that. But uh, yeah, Turn Up That Dial is something that I would recommend to everybody listening. Uh, that's the new album by Dropkick Murphys out on April the 30th. Um, if you also aren't familiar with Dropkick Murphys, most people listening will be. But uh, I mean, my personal favourite uh, record uh, that you've done so far and probably the same as a lot of fans is Warriors Code. Um, uh, would you say that that's a great place to start as well? Um, yeah, I think Warriors Code is up there. I mean, Scott, it's just that's that's tough to ask because it's like every record takes you back to a period in time. But um, um, sing lot, I'm I'm um, signed and sealed in blood is another one of my favorites, and um, yeah. Uh, so what the hell, this this is our tenth one, so you got plenty plenty to choose from. Yeah, how do you feel about? Um, the way the record industry is changing but. yeah no we'll never not make full albums i don't care what's going on that's what we'll do I, I i will say that you've noticed the shift and this is about as far as we'll ever shift we used to make 16 song albums now we make 10 or 11 yeah because people say guys they're not you're, you're lucky if you get the new generation to ever make it to track 11 let alone 16 yeah so, Wow. You know what I mean? But, but I do think that it's given us that ability to, I, I also, our songs have gotten a little longer, so it doesn't feel like we're shortchanging anybody at uh, 10 or 11 songs. I think that's kind of the norm now. And it actually was the norm a long yes. time ago. I think, I think in the, the albums are very long, even, even back, back then, you know? Yeah. Like, but I think in, Bill Die was like 16 songs and right. And, and so, that's that's almost like a double LP sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So we've trimmed it back a little there, but uh, 10 or 11 songs is 10, 10 to 12 songs is probably always where we'll stay at for an album. And then we always usually come out with other singles and B-side stuff. So, but, you know, we, we're still releasing usually 16 songs, uh, you know, in the course of an album cycle, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ken, I've got one final question for you, which is, as this is the greatest music of all time podcast, if you had to choose a couple of artists who mean the most to you, artists or bands, who would they be? I would probably say The Clash and The Stones. It's just that, you know, two for me, just, uh, you know, to be an artist that spans, uh, you know, not that the clash spanned a huge amount of time in reality, but the they, musical styles are just, you know, there's, there's, there's so much within that band. And, and you think of the Stones, how long and how, how much they've kind of written different styles of songs. Those are, all, those are always my go-to like formative bands, you know? So if I, have, if I had to pick only two bands I could keep in my record collection, it would definitely be The Clash and The Stones. This episode is brought to you by Tingly. Tingly is on a mission to change the culture of gifting by encouraging everyone to give experiences rather than material things. Tingly's passionate team has handpicked the world's best experiences, including travel, adventure, romance, food, wine and more, and brought them all together in one place. Tingly gives the recipient of the experience freedom of choice. Here's how it works. You purchase a gift box, Tingly sends an e-voucher or delivers a plastic free gift box and the recipient chooses from hundreds of experiences in over a hundred different countries. There's no expiry date on any of Tingly's gift experiences. Tingly encourages us to give stories, not stuff, to treasure memories above possessions. To find out more, go to tingly.com. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, 
you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.